Sometimes you have a game that has no reason to be as good as it is. It could be unpolished, unrefined, held together by strings and dreams, and feels like it could fall apart at any moment, but ends up being an extremely fun and unique experience that in spite of all of the flaws, perceived and otherwise, ends up being better than the sum of its parts. On an unrelated note, let's talk about Dragon's Dogma. Dragon's Dogma 2 is a long-awaited sequel to Dragon's Dogma 1, because that's how numbers work. It's an open-world action RPG where you play as the Arisen, who is destined to fight a dragon who stole your heart in a very non-romantic way. But I won't judge you if you think otherwise. You're not alone on this journey and are aided by pawns, who are people created by the Arisen, whose main goal is to aid the Arisen to the ends of the earth. The rest of the game's story exists. It feels like it sets up a foundation in the first half and then completely falls apart in the second half, and this made me realize something when it comes to RPGs, in particular action RPGs. In the ones that I've played, I've found that they're either more narrative-focused RPGs or combat-focused RPGs. And not to say that a narrative-focused RPG won't have good combat, I mean there's always going to be outliers, but what I particularly mean is that if there's more of a focus on the story, the combat isn't the highlight of the game, or it just ends up getting rather stale as time goes on, whereas a combat-focused RPG would have a narrative, but it's not a requirement to enjoy the game, such as like a Souls-like for example. It's there, but it's not the main focus. Dragon's Dogma 2 is very much a combat-focused action RPG. Dragon's Dogma is a game that wants you to explore. It wants you to decide your own adventure and go where you want to go as you explore caves, find secrets, fight giant monsters, and be gaslighted into liking Monster Hunter. The combat is very satisfying. You have a heavy and light attack and your knee class ability such as an archer aiming down sights or a thief dodging or a fighter blocking with their shield and you also have four abilities that you can bind to your controller buttons. The feeling of combat in the game is some of the best I've experienced and not just because as the hits connect they feel amazing or that the sound design adds to the impact but things that happen in combat can really make or break the experience in hilarious ways. Not only do your attacks have weight but your enemies attacks also have weight and the bigger they are the harder they hit and the further away you get knocked back. This can be frustrating, especially when you know you could curb stomp them, but sometimes the mental image of an ogre drop kicking you into the river is just too funny to pass up. I also think the game has enemies set at certain levels. Goblins you'll fight at the beginning of the game will always be around like level 1 or so, while goblins in later areas will be higher leveled to accommodate your level ups, but it's not that the world levels with you, rather that the areas have their own levels, which is not a new design choice, but what feels odd is enemies themselves are set at their own level. For example, you might notice a cyclops at the start of the game be a bit of a challenge and you'd think that they'd only get harder from here on out. But when you find a cyclops in the latter half of the game, it has the same attacks and same health bar and isn't that much difficult from the first time you fought one. And I don't know how I feel about this. On one hand, I can see how much stronger I've become from the first cyclops, but on the other hand, it feels like each cyclops needs to bow down before me and I'm wasting my time fighting them. Enemies also have set spawn points, which kind of makes it feel a bit more mechanical as I walk back and forth through the world. I'd come to recognize that there's a bunch of harpies that would spawn in an area, or I'm walking through a cave and I know that a minotaur spawns in the cave, and this removes any sense of surprise or randomness I might feel in the world. And I feel this is sort of hit or miss. Other games have done this before, so it's not bad design, but coupled with a world that doesn't level with the player, it ends up removing a lot of the tension and excitement, especially if you're replaying it on like new game plus. Enemy variety is also a complaint in this game, where if you'll find an enemy in the beginning of the game, you'll find them reskinned later, and this is also done with some of the larger monsters, like for example, you might fight an ogre in one area, but then it's a grim ogre in another area. It's just the same kind of mechanics, but instead of focusing on women, it'll focus on men. Or you might find a chimera, but then later on you'll find a gore chimera, which I don't know the difference between, and this is something that people have criticized the game about before, and it's one that I also hold. The class system in the game is something I really enjoy, if only because we can freely swap between them whenever we want for free. There are 9 classes in this game called vocations, with a 10th one allowing you to mix and match the others as you please. They fall in your standard RPG spectrum of classes, from things like fighter, thief, archer, and mage, and then there's 2 advanced vocations, the warrior and sorcerer. There's 2 vocations that mix aspects of the other, such as the mystic spear hand being a fighter mage hybrid and magic archer being an archer mage hybrid. Then there's also the trickster vocation which lets you throw smoke in your enemy's face and relies entirely on pawns 
Pawn Damage, which is a unique way to play, and Warfarer, which I don't think is a real word, being the one that allows you to mix and match. What I really like about the vocations is each one has their own established identity that makes them feel different, and it's something that an RPG with a classless system would lack. People who play warriors want to look and feel like warriors, whereas people who play mages want to look and feel like mages, and that uniqueness helps with the roleplay of the character. And when you want to mix and match the two, then it would be better to feel more unique as opposed to a fighter using a enchanted weapon or a mage wearing heavy armor but still using the same playstyle. You'd think that the archer, for example, and the magic archer would play similarly, but they instead have abilities, attacks, and armors that end up being unique to them to help enforce this class fantasy and identity. A change has been made in the game from the first and it's that each vocation only uses one type of weapon when before each vocation would have a set amount of weapons to use. This means that the Strider vocation in Dragon's Dogma 1 is removed and split into Thief and Archer, and Magic Archer could only use the Magic Bow. Personally, I would have preferred if they allowed the vocations to use multiple types of weapons, but I'm content with what we have in the game right now, and I do recognize that my preference kind of falls back on what I said on the identity for each class and removes that kind of uniqueness towards them. The Pawn system is something that was praised in the first game, and it returns in this game as well. Pawns are your main party, they'll follow you around, they'll have their own fighting style to help the group based on the vocations assigned to them, and they'll occasionally gossip about how other Arisen sleep around or how they have a strong preference for men. Each player has their own main pawn, and those pawns get sent to other Arisen. There's some official ones by Capcom made if you play offline, but I think most of the fun is finding other players' own pawns and bringing them along and seeing what they were taught. If you have a quest that needs to be done, but the pawn you hired already knows the area or who to talk to, then they'll lead you there the best way they know how. Which sometimes means that if the person jumped off a cliff to get there, then the pawn will think, ah, oh, perfect. Jumping off of cliffs is the fastest way to reach our destination. So remember that we all see you and we all see what your pawns are doing. The thing I enjoy most about this is finding pawns wandering about in the game. It makes the world feel a bit more alive and if it looks like a pawn would make a perfect fit for my party, then I can easily invite them to the group and swap out my pawns as needed. You can order your pawns about using four commands you have in-game. Go, follow me, wait, and help. And it's help in specific I want to talk about. If, for example, you are being mauled by wolves and you call for help, your pawn might help you by healing you as you were being repeatedly mauled and, while hilarious, I just want them to get the damn wolves off of me. There's also something added to this game which I think is pretty mean but also really fucking funny, and that's Dragon's Plague. Sometimes a pawn might be a bit sassy, maybe they won't follow your orders, or maybe their eyes will literally glow red. If you don't deal with this pawn by throwing them into the brine or dismissing them, then this pawn will go on a wild night on the town and you'll wake up with a massacre on your hands that only a large amount of wake stones or an eternal wake stone could fix. I assume, though, that this is a way to get people to swap out pawns regularly, but the problem I have with that is that I have become attached to all of these pawns. Yes, your pawn as well, person who's watching this. I love your pawn. They're wonderful, and I'd be upset if they got Dragon's Plague. Also, by the way, you should hire my pawn. She is lovely, and she'll probably gossip about me behind my back. Okay, now here's the part I'm really excited to talk about, the story. Remember when I said that the story exists? Yeah, that word choice was deliberate. There won't be any spoilers in this, and I honestly don't know if that's really possible, but here we go. So you're the Arisen, which makes you the rightful ruler of the city of Vernworth, and you're also the first Arisen in years, which means that the throne has been empty and a regency has been going on. Now there could only be one Arisen at a time, so when you try and make your way over to try and reclaim your throne, you find out that someone else is saying they're the Arisen, and now this raises the question of what's going on, what political espionage is happening. The game starts you off in an excavation site working as a slave alongside other pawns. You also have Amnesia, which is my favorite plot device, and eventually a Medusa attacks the area and some phantom comes by and tells you to get out of there after you fight the Medusa. So you and this pawn Rook run off and jump off a cliff, the first of many, and then you fly on a griffin to reach Vermund, the first country you'll explore. 
Essentially, the story can be cut up into two acts. Act 1 is political espionage as you try to find out more about this false arisen and the regency and how best to go in and reclaim your throne. You'll be dealing with political intrigue, sort of, stealth missions that don't have any stealth mechanics, and overall it's kind of consistent and concise about what it wants to do with the story. A lot of times it feels like a game of D&D, but the dungeon master is railroading you super hard to where the story is going because some things don't really make sense and one cutscene that comes to mind is when you enter a brothel and the madame decides to show you the secret peephole she has to spy on other rooms, which shows us more of the false arisen. Why does she show this to us? Does she know that we're the arisen and is this why we're being shown the peephole? Eventually, you learn there's been dealings with the neighboring country of Batal, so now we have to deal with the geopolitics of a neighboring nation. You head over to Batal yourself and this is where Act 2 starts and where the story falls apart. Part. Now what you might think will happen is more of the same. You'll deal with the politics of Batal and you'll work with them to help you reclaim the throne from this false arisen or something like that. No! <laughs> No, that doesn't happen. Instead, you'll find this guy who's all about these blue crystals and he'll tell you of this guy living in a cave. Then that cave guy, who is known as the Dragonforged, talks about Drake blood or something and mentions some other guy to go talk to. And then a castle rises from the sea as this crazy old man tells you a story. And then you go back to the crystal guy and give him a sword and then you get, you get the sword back. And I don't even know if I want to cut all the footage for this as references because it's just going to be some kind of like visual whiplash. The point is, the end of the game is always going to be closer than you think it is, and when you reach it, you're going to stop and think, wait, this is the end? What the fuck just happened? So I mentioned the game can be cut up into two acts, but I lied about that, okay? I'm sorry, you'll get over it. It's not the first time someone on YouTube has lied to you. But there is a third act of the game, which I won't talk about because that does feel like proper spoiler territory, but if you see someone mentioning something about the end game, that is what like the third act is. Now we talked about the main story, but there are side quests. And you're probably thinking, what about them? Are they as fleshed out as the main story? And that's a good question, and my answer to that is no. They might, however, be a bit more coherent, and they sort of are, but it does make me question some of the world building. So there's one quest I want to talk about, and it's about this elf you see in the city who is coming up to a trial of archery, like a coming-of-age ceremony for him, and he is fascinated by these human bows. So we buy him one, and he's like, wow, look at this design. Can you show me how it works? So we head over and demonstrate a bow to him, and he's like, wow, hey, human bows are designed to be aimed down the sights, which makes me wonder, what were the elves doing? Were they just hip-firing their bows the entire time? So this guy thanks us and is now going to try to aim with his bow, which is apparently revolutionary to him. And this blows my mind that this is what the lore is for the elves. So we see the elf again in the city and he's like, hey, my trial's coming up and you're my friend. Why don't you just come by and, you know, watch me and, you know, show me some support. And we're like, yeah, sure, man, that sounds okay. So we follow him to where the elves are and we learn that his sister was captured by an ogre and his dad, the archer maester, which is like the master archer in the area, he's just like, hey, yeah, no, you haven't done your trial yet, so you can't really, like, come about. It's too dangerous. And the guy's like, well, fuck you, dad. It's my sister. So, hey, how about my friend comes by and helps me? And so we go help rescue his sister from the ogre. And would you believe that the Chekhov's gun in this story is that this guy is now going to aim down his sights with a bow to save his sister. And after we beat the ogre and try to get her out, he's like, hey, check it out. An opening and aims down his sights and, like, breaks down a wall and his dad's like that was pretty badass of you son that was actually kind of cool on how you aim down sights and i know it's a human bow but we are not going to like penalize or anything like that that was pretty badass and your friend here really helped you out that's pretty cool and the elf thanked us and is like oh well thank you my friends i really appreciate that and so when we go back to the elves and we talk to the dad the dad just asked me out on a date and i don't i don't know like why or like what I did like hey like yeah thanks for helping out my son and rescuing my daughter 
So anyway, like, after their mom died, like, dude, no, c calm the fuck down, we, we just met, like, I'm flattered, thank you, but like, no, no, and also I think it's kind of wrong to want to, like, fuck your son's friends. I will say, though, that if you only focus on the main quest, you'll experience about 20% of the game. The rest of it comes from exploration and going out of your way to find things. For example, you know that Sphinx, the one in the trailer? Yeah, that one? Not a part of the main story. I did not even see her in my first playthrough because I didn't explore as much, but I found her in my New Game Plus run because I started to look around a bit more. And I really like this because it makes it feel like it's a kind of old school RPG where you have to go and explore the world to find things rather than being directed towards them. And that makes it even funnier because it adds to how this game itself feels rather dated despite coming out in 2024. Before I move on to the next part, there is something that I need to address with this game and it would be remiss of me if I don't mention it. If you follow the news, then you're going to know what I'm going to be talking about, microtransactions and performance issues. The microtransactions to me feels almost like a non-issue. It's shitty that they're there in the first place, but the fact that it's all things you can get very easily in-game makes the point feel rather moot. But the fact that it's just Capcom being greedy, and they've done this before with Devil May Cry 5, Resident Evil 4 Remake, I'd expect them as well to do it again with Monster Hunter Wilds next year. And this is something that I do not really like. I don't like like having this practice of, hey, maybe if you want to have these things a lot easier, you can just spend a bit of money and then we'd get it to you. And it feels like it's bypassing part of the challenge of the game. It's easy to say don't buy them, but it kind of sets a bad precedence when Capcom will just keep doing this. The performance issue is something that I feel is a much bigger problem. After the first update, the game runs well enough. I don't get as many frame drops in the city and everything in the wilderness seems to be okay. It definitely is a lot better in the desert and Batal, where it feels like there's less assets like trees and foliage about as opposed to Vernworth or Vernmans, whatever it's called. I don't fucking know why they named it the same thing. The desert is better than the forest probably because there's less foliage and things like that. But when you enter cities, you do get some NPC pop in. You may have a few frame drops. Mine had a few frame drops, but I managed to stop that when I turned off ray tracing. And this really feels like this game needed some more time to be optimized. My specs are above what can Capcom recommends, and I'm still getting a few issues, a lot less now after a few patches, but I don't even know if these NPC pop-ins are meant to be like an intended feature or if this is just an issue regarding performance issues or maybe graphic settings. As I finished Dragon's Dogma 2, I felt like I've played a game like this before, and it gave me the urge to load up the first Dragon's Dogma and play that. And what I found is that it's the same game. It's the same game. Oh wow, big revelation. The sequel is similar to the first game. That's not what I mean though. What I mean is that things that made the first game great and things that made the first game jank exist in the second game. Not only did they take all the things that worked before, they also took the things that people thought were like negatives or cons of the first game and said, yeah, let's just put it in the second game. And it just feels like Dragon's Dogma 2 is a sort of slightly polished remake of the first game. And Capcom said, let's try it again and let's see what happens. Let's make make a few adjustments and let's release it. And I don't know why it works, but it does. There's a few things I'm happy though. I'm happy that my pawns don't constantly fucking talk over one another or keep mentioning on how goblins hate ice and fire both. I'm happy that when my pawn does something, the camera doesn't go into slow motion and start focusing on them, taking me out of the combat. I'm also happy that enemies don't feel like they just infinitely spawn in an area when I'm fighting like a chimera or something. I fought a chimera for like, what, 10 fucking minutes and then, oh, surprise, snow harpies and white wolves just show up constantly. Let me just fight this fucking chimera. Get the fuck away from me. I don't want to deal with this bullshit. But this led me to think of something that I thought was actually rather interesting. Now, I don't know how many people want to admit this, but sometimes our favorite games have not aged all too well when it's alongside its sequels. For example, Morrowind hasn't really aged well after Oblivion. Dark Souls 1? Not nah, Dark Souls 3 is the better one. One time, I told some friends to play Dragon Age Origins after they've played through Inquisition, and they told me that the game has not aged too well, and I had to come to the grim reality that they 
might have had a point. That's not to say, of course, that these games are bad, no, like they've not gone from like 9s or 10s down to like a 4 or something. Dragon Age Origins is still one of my favorite games, but I have to recognize that some gameplay mechanics that worked back then, when these games were first released, just don't hold up as well today, and that's really a subjective thing on what you might think of aged well or not. It's based on the familiarity between them. If you are familiar with Morrowind's gameplay as opposed to Oblivion's, you might prefer Morrowind a lot more, especially if you've played through that game before. But what if you had a game that's the opposite? A game that's ahead of its time and has yet to age. A game that is seen as revolutionary for the time, and you want to create a sequel to this game. What do you do? Just make the same game again. Hey everyone, thank you for watching the video, I hope you liked it. I want to say for my final words on this is that Dragon's Dogma just feels really cursed and I don't have a better way to kind of describe it. The standard YouTube fare, if you liked the video then leave a like, if you didn't like it leave a dislike, if you want to see more of my work in the future consider subscribing, and there should be other videos on screen right now if you can't wait until the next video, so until then I hope to see you again, thank you for watching, and remember that I appreciate you.